Okay, so uh, let's kick it off then. So welcome to this uh, first in a series of COCO webinars hosted by Earthworm. Uh, myself, I'm Renzo Vern, and I'll be uh, moderating this time that we have together. So thanks a lot for, for making the time to be here with us. Um, and the title of this, uh, of this webinar is How the Cocoa Industry Can Stop Deforestation. That's what we'll be looking at for the next uh, hour. So next slide, please. For those of you that uh, don't know who we are, um, Earthworm Foundation, we're an organization uh, based in Switzerland. Uh, and we work with companies uh, to go deep into supply chains understand local context and come up with solutions together with people on the ground. So really trying to solve the social and environmental issues that, that exist in supply chains. Uh, as I mentioned, our HQ is in Switzerland, uh, but we have 15 offices uh, around the world with staff throughout uh, Latin America, West Africa, Southeast Asia. That's where the bulk of our people are. And we work with companies uh, in the food sector, in the agri sector, along the supply chain. Uh, when it comes to, to cocoa, we work with companies like Lindt, Nestle, and more recently, Godiva. Uh, next slide, please. So just a bit about uh, why this webinar, uh, why do we feel it's, it's an important time to, to host this? So as we know, the, the, the chocolates industry continues to grow. Uh, we as a society continue to enjoy and consume uh, chocolate products. Uh, and over the past uh, decades, that has come, uh, with that has come the expansion of uh, cocoa. Uh, and the expansion of cocoa has oftentimes been coming uh, at the expense of uh, forest areas. Uh, i.e. deforestation. Uh, more recently, uh, especially over the past couple of years, there's really been a, a strong shift in the amount of uh, companies, the industry itself, uh, governments as well, committing to a different type of cocoa, a cocoa that is made uh, with uh, respecting zero deforestation. Uh, but what we've seen is that um, you know, although those commitments are, are fantastic, what's been a real challenge is making that a reality in the ground, doing zero deforestation in the ground. Uh, and this is really linked to lots of the, the challenges that exist in the supply chain. I mean, it's, uh, it's cocoa is a product essentially produced by, by smallholder farmers, oftentimes living in uh, poverty. Uh, and this means that we have a very fragmented and disjointed uh, supply chain. Um, also, it's very, it's traditionally, it's been very opaque. Uh, there's many different actors involved in the supply chain from the time the cocoa is being produced at origin to the, um, to when you find it in the, in the supermarket shelf with uh, many uh, traders and middlemen in between. So it's been very opaque and that means it's been very hard to to really have accountability and to create the right incentives for people to actually change practices that have been going on for, for a long time. Um, but despite those real challenges that exist, uh, we know that there are solutions. Uh, and uh, there's many different organizations, Earthworm included, but also others that are really testing and trialing these new approaches um, to, to, to create this uh, zero deforestation, make it a reality. Uh, and so in the spirit really of uh, collaboration and sharing to inspire, uh, to lead to greater change, uh, we have put together this webinar and we have our different uh, panelists that will be uh, sharing uh, different insights with you all. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so first off, we will have uh, Etel Yonet, She's a senior campaign director at Mighty Earth, and she will be really be focusing around the, uh, the tools for radical transparency. There's been huge amounts of change uh, in the industry. I'm sure many of you know that, have been seeing that the past few months. Um, she'll be giving us uh, an update of, of where we're at with that, uh, and also sharing some of the very important uh, updates when it comes to legislature that are taking place both at uh, producer country level, but also consumer country level. 
Uh, then we will have uh, Jerome Tokpa. He's, uh, uh, he's from Earthworm Foundation. He's our head of uh, operations in uh, West Africa. And he will be sharing an example from Ivory Coast uh, where we have collaborated directly with uh, the local Ivorian government and have used uh, innovative satellite technologies to make uh, no deforestation, to start making no deforestation a reality. Uh, then we have uh, Rob McWilliam, he's the Director of Technical Services at, at Earthworm, and he will be sharing an example from Ghana, where we use an assessment tool to identify forests within cocoa uh, producing landscapes, and then how this leads to uh, creating uh, no deforestation. Pierre Coste from the French chocolatier Valrona, uh, he leads uh, their participation in the Cacao Forest Project, uh, which takes place in uh, the Dominican Republic. And he'll be sharing uh, how from this experience, they've been able to create value by collaborating between uh, different chocolatiers, implementing partners, uh, farmers and communities to uh, create the transition towards a cocoa production um, that is in harmony and regenerates uh, nature and also is uh, economically viable for farmers. Uh, and last but not least, we have uh, Ethan Budiansky. He's the Director of Environment at the World Cocoa Foundation. And he'll be sharing uh, the different World Cocoa Foundation milestones to date and some perspectives on how companies can get involved to drive uh, further change. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, in terms of how the webinar will function, uh, we'll have 45 minutes uh, during which time the different uh, panelists will share their presentations. During that time, feel free to drop questions at the, in the Q&A section within the Zoom. You just put at and then the name of the person uh, and then during the first 45 minutes, you'll be able to answer some of the questions directly on, on the, in the Q&A. And then we'll have the last 15 minutes dedicated to Q&A as well. And so without further ado, uh, Etel, uh, so next slide, please. Uh, Etel will jump in and she'll be talking to us about uh, transparency and legislature in the cocoa industry. Thank you, Etel. Thank you so much, Renzo, for having me here for this exciting event. It's a pleasure to be a part of it. And yeah, just to dive right in, as Renzo was saying, um, next slide, please. There's been a tremendous problem of deforestation in the industry for decades. Um, so right here, what you're seeing on the screen is a map of Ghana, and all the little red dots that are popping up are deforestation. And as you can see, there's just more and more deforestation with every passing year. Our best estimate is that about one third of deforestation in Ghana is due to cocoa. And if we'll switch to the next slide, you can see that there's also a terrible problem of deforestation in the Ivory Coast, which along with Ghana, uh, uh, those two countries, the top two cocoa producing countries in the world responsible for about 63% of the world's cocoa. And here what you see is the forests in the Ivory Coast in 1990, 2000, and 2015. You can see they're disappearing at a very rapid clip and actually in 2018, we saw that the Ivory Coast and Ghana kind of won the World Cup of intensification of deforestation, not volume of forest loss, but intensification of deforestation. And in Ivory Coast, as in Ghana, about a third of deforestation there is thought to be due for cocoa. And um, Jérôme is going to dive into the details of that, so I won't um, carry on that. But just to bring home the point that everywhere we've looked at deforestation, whether it's Ivory Coast, Ghana, Cameroon, Peru, Ecuador, Indonesia, um, everywhere we look at satellite maps of cocoa producing regions, the deforestation is quite dire. I think that the, the opacity that Renzo talked about and the, the plague of child labor, which has so bedeviled the cocoa industry, these tend to be things that are more well known. It's only in the past couple of years that deforestation has popped up um, in popular awareness and industry awareness and lawmakers awareness. And I'll head to the next slide. And I will stop talking quite so much about the problem, and I will talk a little bit about the solution. Um, and, you know, something that's important to remember is that the issue of deforestation in cocoa, it's a massive conundrum. It's a, a, a global problem, really. And 
it took many different actors to get there and the solution also requires many different actors to join in. And so the solution can be quite multifaceted and I'll sort of run through different elements of responsibility and opportunity and challenges that different stakeholders in the cocoa ecosystem have. So I think a really important part of what we need to see in terms of change in the cocoa industry comes from consumers and the media and just popular awareness growing. And that's something that's really picked up in the last couple of years. So we've seen more and more NGOs mobilizing around cocoa, a really big uptick in social media and media coverage, shareholders and investors getting involved, even with shareholder resolutions against some of the world's largest um, chocolate companies. And one really encouraging sign is that in the last three years, we've seen 1.1 million signatures on petitions for sustainable cocoa. And in the whole 17 years prior to that, there were 1.2 million signatures. So you can kind of sense this immense movement of people rising up to say, this is not okay as consumers or as other stakeholders, we want a different kind of cocoa. And I think that's a, a really important thing that all of us can understand is, is a key part of the solution. Let's go to the next slide. We're also seeing really encouraging change in producer countries. You know, there's a lot of problems with the way that producer countries in the past um, and even to this day have engaged with the problem of deforestation for cocoa, but the tide is beginning to turn. Um, one of our speakers, Ethan Budiansky, will really do a very deep dive into one of the most successful and important parts of producer country momentum for reform and for change, and that's called the Cocoa and Forest Initiative. And I'll let him discuss it. He's really one of the top experts in the world, and um, his uh, organization, the World Cocoa Foundation, is um, part of leading the CFI, the Cocoa and Forest Initiative. But I think it is worth noting that not only has CFI taken off in Ivory Coast and Ghana, but one year after those two countries um, announced and launched their CFIs, we saw one come about in Colombia, in Latin America, and um, there's one in Cameroon, which is just on the verge of being announced. Uh, we're sort of waiting for it any month now. But we've also had public commitment from the government of Liberia that they wanted to do their own CFI. And we see initiatives that are similar in countries like Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, Madagascar, even in Belize, little rumblings of intention by a government industry and NGOs to come together in public-private partnerships that ensure that we turn our backs on deforestation for cocoa and that at a national level in producer countries, there's a real um, overhaul of policy and law. And just in the Ivory Coast, I think um, it's worth mentioning that there's tree tenure reforms afoot. That's vital because it's very hard to change from pesticide-soaked monoculture to nature-loving agroforestry if you don't have good tree tenure laws. If you have bad tree tenure laws, it can create the wrong incentive for agroforestry. We see land tenure reforms afoot. We see park monitoring agencies that had a deep history of corruption and mismanagement and being part of the problem, trying to turn the page and move into being part of the solution. Um, and even in the Ivory Coast, there's a classified forest that was turned into a national park and got extra protections um, from deforestation for cocoa and other commodities. Um, and indeed, the Ivory Coast overhauled all of its forest code, and I think Jérôme can speak about that. But maybe something that's also important to note, it's not only laws that have to change, it's also policies, which you could think of as soft law. And so um, in the Ivory Coast and Ghana, we've seen these changes towards agroforestry policies and definitions that are evolving. And that brings me towards um, what's happening in consumer countries, which is also very important. Um, you know, essentially, you could think of the supply and the demand as being the two butterfly wings that need to flap together for us to be able to fly out of the um, catastrophe of deforestation into a better future. So let's talk about the top um, importer of cocoa, which is the EU. You know, it's my understanding that um, Holland alone imports more cocoa than all of North America combined. So the EU is by far and away the biggest importer of cocoa, biggest manufacturer of chocolate, and the biggest consumer of chocolate as well. So in the EU, we see a great deal of momentum towards mandatory human rights and due diligence laws, and also towards um, uh, the 
possibility of making trade deals with key cocoa producing countries um, contingent upon environmental and human rights norms. In the US, we see already in California that there's been a deforestation free procurement act that was proposed and it came one vote short of passing. Um, so I think a lot of people are quite hopeful that next time around it will pass. There's a copycat bill that looks much like the California bill, which has been proposed for New York, but perhaps um, even more encouraging at the federal level in the US, um, Senator Schatz from Hawaii uh, is looking at um, legislation that would bar imported deforestation and high risk commodities in the US, including cocoa, but of course also palm oil. And rubber. Uh, and it's a story because uh, I'll, I'll, I'll speed up. Sorry. And the Sorry. transparency is super interesting. So yes. Okay, so I'll zoom through just the last um, really interesting uh, points on the consumer geographies is that the UK proposed a law just a couple weeks ago that would also block imported deforestation. It's less robust than what's being talked about in the EU because it's only illegal deforestation, but nonetheless, it's quite an interesting marker in the trend. And in Switzerland, there's um, still the possibility of Swiss law that would cover deforestation and human rights entering Swiss supply chains. So all those things are needed because it's not fair for only producer countries to have to bear the burden. It's good for consumer countries to shoulder some of the burden too. And perhaps one of the most encouraging elements in the reforms that we see that lead towards trying to curb and end cocoa deforestation is a big revolution in traceability and transparency. I think whereas cocoa started um, much behind palm oil uh, a couple of years ago, palm oil's way ahead, cocoa is now looking like it's going to outstrip a lot of other agri-commodities in terms of traceability and transparency. And why is that so important? If you don't know where your cocoa is from, you can't know whether it's tied to deforestation or not. You can't even check to see whether the deforestation that you see in satellite maps matches up with your supply chain or any other problem, whether it's child labor or something else. And so Mighty Earth has created something called the Cocoa Accountability Map, where we've hoovered up the data that more and more chocolate and cocoa companies have been disclosing, where you see one chocolate and cocoa company after another, starting with Nestle, but all the way through to and Bahit Daibu and Mars two weeks ago, and Olam going another step further last week, I believe. All the top cocoa and um, chocolate companies, with just a handful of exceptions, like Ferrero and Tutum, which are behind the curve, or Blama, which is refused, almost all of them are getting into this revolution. That means they're disclosing their supply chains all the way down to the cocoa cooperative level. And at Mighty Earth, we've not only tried to centralize all their disclosure, We've also got all the cocoa cooperatives in the Ivory Coast. And as of last week, we've got all the pisteurs agréés, um, which we'll be putting into our map very soon. And thanks to the work of Vivid Economics, we have all the land use and the deforestation, which also um, uh, is, is thanks to Global Forest Watch. So all of these elements we've combined. So now in one map, you can see where is the cocoa, where is the deforestation, where are the supply chains. This is how you have the keys to beginning to end deforestation by monitoring to make the promises a reality. And I think Ethan will talk more about how um, our deep hope is that the Cocoa and Forest Initiative can take on monitoring and my dearest would love to give this map over to CFI. And I think that there's tremendous potential to do stuff like this, not only in Ivory Coast, but also Ghana and Colombia and other cocoa producing countries. So on that happy note, um, which is this sort of, uh, real stride that the cocoa industry has taken in the last couple of years. I will pass it back to Renzo. Thanks a lot, Etel. Uh, that was uh, wonderful. And uh, from getting that overview of these tools of uh, traceability and uh, legislature, um, now we will pass it over to, to Jerome Topa, uh, who will be sharing with us how satellite technologies can be a tool to support in making no deforestation a reality. So over to you, Jérôme. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Renzo. Hopefully you can hear me. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, connecting from Ivory Coast from Abidjan. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I have to share with you some of the experience we, we have here in Ivory Coast and happy to, to do that uh, now. Um, next slide. Uh, as you may know, and you have seen also the previous slide of Etel, um, you know, uh, Ivory Coast is uh, one of the, the 
biggest uh, cocoa producer in the world. I mean, the first cocoa producer in the world with 40% of the world cocoa. But at the same time, uh, and next slide. At the same time, we are also, uh, you know, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest uh, deforestation driver in, in, in the world. Uh, and, and one of the key, uh, agriculture is the key driver, uh, for sure, 62%. Uh, and within the agriculture, agricultural commodities, of course, uh, we are first cocoa producer, so cocoa is, is, is the leader in the deforestation in the country. 38%. Um, and uh, for your information, the last remaining dense forest we have here in Ivory, because I mean, I mean continuous forest, uh, is in the western part of the country. Uh, and and um, the, the good thing is this forest uh, is really um, is linking Ivory Coast, the Thai National Park you, you are seeing on the, on the right, uh, to the Sapo Grebo uh, uh, National Park in, in uh, National Park in, in Liberia, and for your information, um, those forests are home for endangered species today, uh, like chimpanzee, like pygmy hippopotamus, uh, etc. So, so just to tell you the importance of the forest in terms of biodiversity. Uh, and in terms of also of uh, you know high carbon stock uh, forest. Next slide. So when we started actually in in 2017 uh, here, you know with with the monitoring activity, we were approached by Sodefor because we had the first meeting where we presented actually what we do as work uh, at her form, and we were approached by the Sodefor. Uh, who asked us, uh, okay, you can do monitoring, you can, you can see, you know, in palm business, you can see where deforestation is occurring. Uh, however, uh, for in, in the forest reserve here in Ivory Coast, we have uh, about 234 forest reserves. Here in Ivory Coast, the challenge we have today is that people are infiltrating forest, forest reserve, and also national park, let's say, protected area. And the, the, the challenge we have is that they are also, you know, clearing under the canopy, planting the cocoa, and the cocoa, when the cocoa are growing, when they are flourishing, then they, they, stand, they start cutting uh, the, the big trees. So is it possible to have, you know, to have a kind of technology that can, can also see the, the forest disturbance under the canopy? So in 2017, we, we came, I mean, 2018, we produced the first base map. It was really a trial, mixing optic imageries with radar imageries. And we came to this base map uh, where we could see actually the, the current stand of the forest, 58% of the dense forest. However, the forest disturbance was about 77%. Uh, so it is from there where we start actually doing the alert in three months. Next slide. Next slide. So you can see here from 2018, Q1 2018 to, to day Q2 to, to 2020, you can see you know, how the deforestation uh, is occurring actually in this forest reserve, in the Cavalier Forest Reserve. You could see that, you know, we were able to see that we have the decrease in the deforestation, but we don't have this, we, we didn't stop the deforestation. So for us, this deforestation, this monitoring allow us actually to see where, where in, in which forest patches we have deforestation and we could control or the sort of could control the patrol on the ground to go there where deforestation is occurring. However, next slide, we couldn't really stop the deforestation. It's the reason why we came out with some ideas and, and, and went to, 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 you know, chocolate manufacturers, uh, manufacturers, uh, we went to, to, to traders to, to, to tell them what 
uh, the challenges actually uh, in, in the remaining forest in Ivory Coast and what we could eventually do. So we came with, with as you can see, with five pillars, but we speak about the four, four pillars. The first pillar is, okay, we have seen where our forests, where our degraded area, and how can we actually restore the forest but conserve also the, the remaining forest? So the first pillar was to end the deforestation, to stop the deforestation on the, the, the forest where we have forest today. And the second one is how can we restore actually the degraded area? And that can only be done with, with community, with, with farmers. So the, 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 third, uh, the third pillar is how can we actually you know, go in a kind of transition pathway where we work with people who are currently in the forest, who have plantations in the forest and are not, but are not living there. They have to go from the forest preserve. How can we work together with them so that they can have also, a, you know, uh, alternative livelihood, but outside the forest reserve. And of course, at the periphery of the forest reserve, how can we develop the resilience of the panel that are there? You know, high productivity, agroforestry system, and, and, and so on. Next slide, please. So for us, we think that, you know, uh, the satellite monitoring is, is key today in, in, in uh, you know, seeing where the deforestation, the deforestation is occurring. However, we can, not just use the satellite imagery to, to stop the deforestation. There's a reason why we, 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 we say that we have to work on the ground. Uh, the work in the ground and the satellite imagery, imagery combined can help, you know, mapping risk, uh, high risk areas. They can help also in the traceability system. Uh, they can help in land use planning and of course transparency like uh, Ethel was talking about. Just speaking about the traceability system, if I have, I don't know if I have one minute, but today everybody is producing polygon around the cocoa plantation. And if you want to produce polygon each year, it is tremendous money. It costs a lot of money. So we think that if you, you, you overlap the, the, the polygon with the imagery that, that the satellite will be given, we have a better way to save money, but really follow as quick as possible uh, deforestation on the ground and, and take uh, action, of course. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks a lot, Jerome. Uh, and now, now we're going to have uh, Rob McWilliam on. And uh, Rob, you know, lots of, lots of companies, of course, are signing up to, to no deforestation. But, but a question that, that always comes up is, OK, that means we have to protect the forest, but how do we actually go about identifying the forest in these uh, cocoa production landscapes? Uh, can you tell us a bit about that? Excellent. Thanks, Renzo. Uh, hello, everyone. <clears throat> yeah, as uh, what I'd like to take you through in the next uh, seven minutes or so is, is sort of uh, a practical application of how we've gone about identifying conservation values within the cocoa supply chain. Uh, very specifically in, a, in an area around uh, the township of Enchi in Western Ghana, but I'll walk you through sort of the process. Importantly, this was uh, a, a, a partnership between Earthworm Foundation and Linton Sprungli, um, you know, and it represents uh, a unique, uh, at this point, a unique uh, application of, of methodologies to identify what's uh, important to conserve within cocoa production landscapes. Next slide. So clearly the other speakers have really talked about cocoa and its links to deforestation. Um, so I won't talk too much more about that. I think what's really important is that businesses uh, as signal, sig single businesses or as, as collaborations uh, are committing to ending uh, the practice of expansion of cocoa farms into forests. Uh, so this is a, a really promising direction and I know Ethan will pick up more on what the Cocoa Forest Initiative is and how that's is going about starting to address the, the deforestation part of cocoa. But the, importantly, the, the commitments there. But how do we implement these commitments? Next slide. So the first challenge is, is what do we conserve? Now clearly what's within protected areas or what's within uh, forest reserves, uh, these are legally protected. They're not areas where uh, any kind of agricultural commodity should be grown or, or any type of other encroachment. 
Um, so what, what we're really focusing on is what should be conserved beyond the protected area network within countries or the forest reserves and, and other legally protected uh, places. Um, and that creates a challenge because there's just a lot going on um, and there's different varieties and diversities of land cover. Uh, there's different types of, of values that communities or conservationists or ecologists would look at outside of this reserve network. Uh, and so uh, a challenge to overcome is to identify what is important to conserve. Next. Fortunately, we've got uh, two critical tools that are helping in this. Um, one of those tools is the High Conservation Value Assessment Toolkit. And this is uh, around 20 years old. Um, and it's, it's constantly evolving. Uh, it's constantly evolving to reflect some of the challenges that the agricultural expansion space is facing, i.e. we have uh, a lot of um, smallholder farmers that uh, are seeking to, to improve their livelihood situation. That can often lead to an interaction with the forest and often the, the clearance of forest to grow various types of crops, including cocoa. Um, so there's a reflection on, on that challenge and how do we build methodologies to be fit for purpose for these instances of, of, uh, of, of deforestation. The second toolkit uh, or, or tool that we use is called the high carbon stock approach, uh, which is around five years old. Uh, and it came into life uh, around the no deforestation commitments that were created by the palm oil sector. Uh, but now this tool is, is very much applied uh, more than palm. It, it's applied in soy, in, in, uh, in rubber, in pulp and paper. Uh, and these are important applications. The application of these tools into cocoa and specifically in landscapes dominated by smallholders is, is not necessarily mature. It's something that uh, a number of organisations, including Earthworm, are working on to see how we could uh, apply these uh, methodologies to ensure we identify what should be kept. Um, in, in, in the expansion of agriculture. Next, please. So some of the, the key steps uh, in, in the, the process is firstly, stakeholder engagement. So there's a lot of work done by the assessment team when we apply these two methodologies of HCS and HCV, high conservation value and high carbon stock assessments, to engage stakeholders. They could be at the national level, uh, sub-national or the local level. Um, these, uh, through that stakeholder engagement, it's really important that they understand what we're, what we're trying to achieve, uh, particularly as we get closer to the ground uh, at the community level, um, what we're trying to achieve and how that will impact them going forward and uh, sort of where the benefits lie for them in, in the identification of these areas. Beyond stakeholder engagement, um, there's a land cover and mapping work, um, basically taking satellite data that Jerome was touching on really identify where is the forest, where isn't the forest, where are certain conservation values that are identified by NGOs, by government, or, or even by the local community. We also send feet to the field uh, where we can you know, quantify sort of carbon in forests and we can look uh, for sort of species presence or habitat presence. Uh, and that's a critical piece of the, of the puzzle to really inform sort of what should be the areas that are, are considered for conservation. So we analyze those results using a number of ecological principles um, and, and that identifies those, those key areas that we should be factoring into conservation. And then there's, there's the ultimate, the conservation actions that need to be taken with the relevant stakeholders on the ground. Can we move to the next? So the study site that we looked at, uh, it represented about 60,000 hectares. As I mentioned before, it was really centered around the township of Enchi in Western Ghana. Um, and really the aims of what we were trying to achieve through this was to test those two methodologies uh, that have, have, have existed for quite some time, have been largely implemented at management unit level. So it's a company that has a concession. Um, so to test these methodologies in a very complex large uh, smallholder dominated landscape to learn from those tests. Do these methodologies work? Um, do, what, what can come out of them so that we can then think about how we replicate and scale up? Obviously, cocoa just doesn't come from Enchi, around the township of Enchi, comes across from Ivory Coast and Ghana and, and other parts of the world. So how do we get to a point of learning that we can scale these methodologies to all of those areas to speed this process up? Move to the next. So where we got to in terms of uh, the, the results, so I'll, I'll kind of go from the top left down to the bottom right. 
um, essentially we've got that satellite imagery. So that's over the 60,000 hectares around the township of Enchi. Enchi is that kind of white area in the middle of that satellite image. And you can see large forest areas uh, to the bottom and to the, to the top. Um, we take that then and we try to process where is the forest in this area and where isn't the forest. Um, that's a really critical piece because often the forest is important for conservation values, whether they be biodiversity or even cultural values, but uh, also important for carbon values, obviously. Um, once we've got where the forest is, then we try to understand, okay, what should not be touched? Uh, where, where are these uh, legally protected areas? So that comes from government data sets like the, from the government of Ghana. Um, and then on the bottom right hand side is really where all the results, the field work, the community engagement, uh, the, the computer processing, et cetera, comes together where we can say, okay, those are the legally protected areas uh, in the hatchings and we can see in the pink areas, these are important areas to conserve for a, immediately for a, cons a, a, a high carbon stock or a high conservation value. Then we have areas that are in blue which are, are also extremely important to conserve. However, they need some level of mitigation because through that assessment and the application of these toolkits, we've identified that there's an ongoing threat to those areas, i.e. the expansion of agriculture, uh, could be for cocoa or other uh, livelihood agricultural activities of those communities. Um, so there needs to be work to engage communities on, on mitigation uh, actions. And then there's a, a whole host of other areas that have a potential HCV or HCS value that still need a further work. But because these areas of forest or, or uh, tracts of land are, are very small, it does require an additional step to be certain that those, there is a habitat value or there is a species value or there is carbon values to, to conserve there. Move to the next. Lastly, just some of these observations from that assessment work uh, to feed in not only to just a local level in, around Enchi, but uh, how do we take it forward to, to address uh, deforestation globally linked to cocoa? So firstly, in the study site, we, and, and that's very true of what we see in, in, um, Ghana, across Ghana and, and Ivory Coast, it's very fragmented, the remaining uh, forest cover outside of the protected area networks or forest reserves. Um, and that fragmentation represents um, opportunities for conservation, although uh, albeit a little bit more uh, difficult to achieve, um, because farmers are looking at that fragmented forest, um, not on a daily basis, but they are opportunities for farmers to, to expand uh, their agricultural activities, to improve their income, uh, et cetera. So there needs to be sort of this uh, fragmentation of these values factored into the engagement of communities and farmers to see what are locally relevant incentives or support packages that, uh, that organisations can provide, businesses can provide, or governments can provide to those communities to protect these values. There's a whole host of opportunity to scale these assessments uh, to the global level across the cocoa supply chain. Uh, it, it really is the, the most toughest thing to do, but we, we really do need to do it. Um, the, the opportunities really exist in the technology that's now available and the way we're all connected and, and you know, really local information feeding into a global level uh, and this type of technology can scale up uh, the assessment of high carbon stock and high conservation values across the cocoa supply chain. And lastly, the, the need to continuously work at the challenge of not only just identifying where these are in the cocoa, where these values are in the cocoa supply chain, but how do we ensure or how do we support the local actors to conserve these values? It's not a traditional thing for people to do to, to go out and protect a patch of forest behind their house that is habitat for, for some animal or has a carbon value. Um, so how do we intervene and, and support those communities with making a decision that protects that forest uh, and, and they uh, get some benefit out of it, not just that uh, uh, it's, it's something that they have to do because they're a farmer. Uh, that needs to be a, a win for them in it. They're, they're kind of the core, core uh, learnings and, and lessons that I'd share here. Happy to take questions later on. Thanks, Renzo. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Rob, for that. Um, and so I think it's, it's really interesting because you have uh, Etel who, who started really with public awareness, how that leads to legislature, uh, driving and transparency in the industry. And then, you know, with, with Jerome talking about satellite uh, technologies and yourself, yourself, Rob, with uh, uh, assessment tools to identify forest areas. I think we're getting further down and it's a nice 
transition now to, to Pierre, uh, as Pierre is going to be talking about how in the end of the day, uh, resilience of, of farmers is really fundamental uh, to actually make the no deforestation uh, a, a reality. Um, so, so thanks a lot, Rob. Uh, we'll go over to Pierre and just quickly, if if any of you, um, Rob, Jerome, yeah, Ethan, Etel, Pierre, there's a few questions coming into the Q and A. So feel free to to uh, reply to those, and we'll try to keep also some time uh, at the end. So, without further ado, Pierre, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Randall. So. Uh, my presentation is about uh, solutions. When you know the situation, you have to face it. So let us try to find solutions. Cacao Forest is a project designed with the farmers to find local and systemic solutions in order to increase the resilience of agricultural systems. So as you may have noticed, uh, we do not claim to have a direct impact on the deforestation. However, we are working all together on the resilience of the systems to make sure that the producers will be able to, say, to stay on their farms, on the same rich plots, in a fair environmental, social and economical context for long. And it's not so easy. So as you, no, yeah, we, we keep that one. As you can say, uh, see on this slide, uh, this is a very collaborative project. It was launched with very various partners, uh, research institutes, chocolate factory, NGOs like Earthworm, uh, agronomic schools, um, distributors, chocolate makers, coop farmers for sure. And in 2020, we start. We have just started a new phase uh, with the support of the Agence Française de Développement. Why is Cacao Forest so collaborative? First, money. <laughs> we still need money. And uh, it's easier to share the necessary costs with, uh, with uh, more people, in fact. Notice that it is a public-private pr project, so the money is coming from public and private funds. It's allowing us to address as local short-term issues as long-term, uh, wider frame uh, problems. The second point is about adoption. What I mean by that, uh, with adoption is having with us all the shareholders, and especially the farmers, the technicians for, from the COPS, since the beginning of the project is a guarantee that the people will adopt the innovations issued from Cacao Forest. Why? Simply because these innovations are their ideas. It's common sense, but it's, it is not so well applied in the field usually. I wrote also energy and leadership. Maybe the most important, a huge part of the problem, I think, is about facing, fighting all the false beliefs, some other people who say fake news about agroforestry type it has always been like that why do you want to change it is not possible oh agroforestry is so romantic i heard that so the whole team will allow us to keep forward whatever they say we also need knowledge and skills from very various areas practical and more theoretical to create discussions and to avoid top-down mechanisms finally we pay attention in getting permanent returns uh, on what we do, what we want to do. This is uh, what I call wisdom. There is nothing more efficient than one simple question from one of the shareholders, sometime far from the field, but it, it, it keeps us focused on the initial objectives. And I think it's very important. So I learned one lesson, never start alone. It will at least avoid create another new agroforestry project as you may have uh, seen so many. Uh, and it's always better to partner with an existing uh, initiative, I think. Next slide, please. So what do we do in this project? 
we imagine all together agroforestry systems. We test them and we train the people on the innovations just created and on other knowledge. We work on the non cocoa value chains, and I will explain that just after. We communicate a lot. We share the results and the evidences we just obtained. So in the center of the project, you have science, training, communication. These three components are linked, creating knowledge and sharing openly this knowledge to seed the next step. Writing a technical leaflet, as you have a very good one here, written by the CIRAD, writing this leaflet is very good, but it's not enough. So you have, it's a permanent, uh, permanent uh, processes. As an example, also of the quite original approach we had, you have some pictures on this slide of design workshops organized with farmers moderated by a CIRAD PhD student. He was applying very innovative uh, methods like serious games, drawings, um, to make sure that all the point of views and ideas would be take, uh, taken into account. So it's very important and it worked properly. So next slide, please. Last important point is about the non-cocoa value chains. It would be useless to create agroforestry systems combining cocoa with avocado if there is no market for avocados. It's, it, it sounds simple, but I, I've seen so many projects uh, where it was not so simple. So agroforestry means diversification all along the value chain from the field to the market. We decided to address this issue with the same test and learn technique we had in the field, working with the farmers and some local, local actors to invent new value chains. You, are here, you have here on this slide, for example, some pictures of the test of commercialization of fruits, vegetables were organized in uh, uh, 2018. So the vegetables were produced in cocoa farm and sold in local organic supermarkets in the town Santo Domingo. And it worked properly. In fact, they, they made a lot of money. So today we are working on the implementation of this type of value chains involving more farmers, involving also the coop because it's very, uh, very often the cooperatives are not so keen of uh, diversifying their own activity. So diversification is really from the field to the market. As a, as a conclusion, I don't know. Yeah, as a conclusion uh, to this presentation, uh, we do think uh, that there are solutions to make cocoa cultivation sustainable and to stop the deforestation due to the new cocoa farm settlements. But there is no way that we will find these solutions without working locally with the farmers. They have to be in the center of the project. And it is also crystal clear that this solution is not only a, a cocoa solution. To fight the deforestation altogether, we have to rethink and to renovate the whole agriculture. It's not easy, but it's feasible. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Pierre. Uh, and just uh, conscious of, of time, uh, we're running a, a bit late already, so that's no problem. So we'll have Ethan now uh, share a bit the, the milestones that uh, the CFI ha has, has accomplished uh, over the past years. Uh, but then very importantly, some of the perspectives on, on really amplifying and accelerating that, that change. Uh, we'll also be sticking around for about 10 minutes afterwards to, uh, to field some questions, uh, but we'll do that after Ethan. So without further ado, um, thanks a lot, Ethan. Oh, thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to present. I mean, I think all of the previous presentations um, really play into the complexity of tackling deforestation, but as well as some of those really great and 
and innovative solutions that are, that are driving forward. So I'm going to talk to you about driving collective action to eliminate deforestation. Next slide. So over the past two years, we have seen unprecedented company and government action to address deforestation in West Africa, particularly in um, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. In the past two years, we've seen companies distributing over 4 million trees for the promotion of cocoa agroforestry and, and forest restoration, mapping over a million farms to achieve traceability um, down to the farm level. Um, training over a million farmers in, in good agricultural practices so that they will be growing more cocoa on less land, decreasing the, the, the stress being put on remaining forested areas. And very recently, the UN Convention on Biological Diversity reported that from 2018 to 2019, the rate of deforestation was actually halved in both Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana um, as a result of numerous actions, um, and policies, including this crazy thing I'm going to talk to you about, the Cocoa Enforced Initiative. So let's keep on going. Let's talk about what is the World Cocoa Foundation in the first place. Um, WCF, we have a vision of a sustainable and thriving cocoa sector where farmers prosper, communities are empowered, and the planet is healthy. We convene over 100 leading cocoa and chocolate companies around the world. Um, representing about 85% of the cocoa and chocolate value chain to champion multi-stakeholder partnerships to achieve, well, to achieve cocoa sustainability globally. Next slide. Now, since I started 10 years ago at the World Cocoa Foundation, I've seen a real shift. And I think Atel actually mentioned this a little bit. A real shift in, in um, the focus being placed on addressing environmental sustainability in the cocoa sector, that you need a healthy planet and in order to improve livelihoods and to ensure we've got long-term cocoa production. Um, the initial focus and continues was on addressing the impact of climate change. Um, and more recently, and what we'll be talking more about and what we have been talking about is a real concerted effort to eliminating deforestation in the cocoa value chain globally starting in west africa so that then brings us to the next slide now addressing deforestation is not something that any one stakeholder can can achieve on their own they not there is no one stakeholder that can eliminate deforestation it really takes the effort investment action of all stakeholders that's why 2017, WCF partnered with IDH, the International um, Sustainability Unit, to bring together leading cocoa and chocolate companies, at this point, 36 cocoa and chocolate companies around the world, um, in a joint commitment, initially with the governments of Ivory Coast and Ghana, to eliminate cocoa-related deforestation and restore forested areas. Next slide. And Industry and government have put forward unprecedented public-private commitments around three core areas. Forest protection and restoration, sustainable production and improving farmers' livelihoods, and community engagement and social inclusion. And on top of all of that, ensuring that there is a strong measurement and monitoring process in place. Next. Now, the World Cocoa Foundation, sorry, the, the Cocoa and Forest Initiative is founded on accountability and transparency. <clears throat> With both industry and government developing action plans individually and as an aggregate, publishing them, and then most recently producing progress reports demonstrating the, the, the progress that they've made on their core commitments to tackle deforestation in the cocoa sector. These progress reports were, were published back in March of this year, and you can actually see um, the aggregate numbers that I talked about at the beginning of this, of this presentation. Given the time, I'm not gonna go into these numbers, happy to answer any questions, but I invite all of you to actually check out the progress reports, and you can find the link below, and I believe this will be shared with you afterwards. 
But I really want to end with what's next. We've made a lot of progress so far, but clearly we have not tackled the issue of deforestation. There is a lot more work to go. To go. So what's next? What are our key priorities going forward? First off, achieving 100% traceability at the entire national level, ensuring that we know where the cocoa is coming from, both in the direct supply chains as well as the indirect supply chains. Establishing a national satellite monitoring platform where the governments take a lead in monitoring the forest and monitoring deforestation, being able to report on progress and then putting in place um, alert systems so that there is you know, proactive um, addressing of any new deforestation. Both of these core commitments are in progress, but there is a lot more work to be get done to bring both the public and the private sector together to make them a reality. The third is a bit of a call to action on this call. Building greater public-private collaboration to tackle deforestation. Like I said, it's not just industry that can do it alone. It's not just government that can do it alone. It really requires the, the participation, investment, action of all key stakeholders if we really want to see change in West Africa and globally. Fourth, driving landscape and jurisdictional approaches. We moving away from just a commodity focused approach to, to a much more holistic approach, looking across um, cocoa landscapes to not only address deforestation, drive sustainability, but also improve farmer and community livelihoods. And then finally, identifying more opportunities for, for collective action. Um, moving away from siloed approaches mm -hmm. to where are those opportunities where we can drive efficiency, we can accelerate action, we can scale up action. Those are the key focuses moving forward. And I really invite all of you to join us. And I'm just gonna end with, with I think a very telling and important quote from unfortunately the, the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Fight for the things that you care about but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. And that's what we're trying to do at WCF. That's what we're trying to do with the Cocoa and Forest Initiative. Thank you, and I, I look forward to any questions. Thanks a lot, Ethan. That's, that's really fantastic. And we're right at the hour mark. Uh, so as I, as I mentioned, we'll stay on 10 minutes for anyone else that, uh, that has the availability to stay on uh, and listen on in the Q&A. For those of you that have to go, uh, just know that uh, this webinar will be, was recorded. Uh, we will be sharing that uh, with you. Uh, and yeah, we thank you uh, for, for having joined us. Um, so, Thanks a lot. And now let's go into the Q&A. Um, so there's lots of questions coming in. And uh, I think there's a couple related to the, the price for cocoa. So, so maybe to Etel, please. Um, there, there's a question here. What is the cost of zero deforestation cocoa? Should companies be paying more for the cocoa they buy? And uh, just a follow-up question to that uh, same topic is, do you feel that uh, consumers are willing to pay that additional price? And I think you're on mute. <laughs> I can answer the second question first, actually, because it, it yes. gives us hope for the answer to the first question, which is a lot of consumers do want to pay more. And you're not hearing it from tree huggers like me or human rights activists. You're hearing it from Cargill which is one of the world's biggest agri-commodity traders. They commissioned a study from a very reputable polling organization that polled um, quite a large number of consumers and found that many consumers actually want sustainable chocolate and are willing to pay for it. And apparently the younger they are, the more willing they are to pay for it. And Ethan might know the details of that poll and study better than I do, but it was a very heartening, um, uh, opinion poll that Cargill put out. So the answer is yes, people do want to pay. And then the other, uh, to answer your other question is yes, it does cost more to go for no deforestation cocoa, just like it costs more to have cocoa that's not made by children or slaves. You know, anytime you put in place monitoring, traceability, tracking systems, due diligence, it does cost money. 
And it's nothing to sneeze at. And I think it's fair for companies to be worried about this. But at the same time, it's very important to remember that we don't need to always go for, you know, a system that's incredibly expensive where there's diminishing marginal returns. So for example, to look at deforestation, there are ways where you can do it where it's extremely expensive that include LIDAR um, to track deforestation under the forest canopy, but you can also do deforestation monitoring that's much less expensive thanks to relatively cheap satellite uh, monitoring technology available today. And I'll just close by saying that our COCO accountability map, which brings together all the um, supply chains, the pisteurs, the cooperatives, all of that work cost us less than $30,000 a year. And our field investigations to document um, illegal and legal deforestation for cocoa that we've done with Mighty Earth um, cost usually less than $20,000, $30,000 a pop. So if a monitoring mechanism was to be set up that did that kind of field investigations, of course, you can spend a bajillion dollars on anything if you want to. But I think the, the, the reassuring and positive answer is it does cost money, but it's a reasonable price tag. And if everyone comes together and pools the satellite monitoring and pools the field investigations, it's a lot cheaper and it's less duplicative. Instead of having 17 companies each monitor 17 times the same thing, pay 17 times as much. You can share costs and have a better result that doesn't allow for a leakage market. Thanks, thanks a lot, Etel, for that. Uh, let's continue then with some of these questions. And yeah, sorry, because there's a lot going on in the Q&A and in the, the chat. But um, maybe a, a question for, for Rob uh, McWilliam, because I saw there's a few related to incentives that, that you've been answering. But there's another one, which is, um, uh, are the proposed incentives to farmers, uh, are they to maintain forests in the entire jurisdiction or just uh, that cocoa should not be going into forest. Uh, so Rob, if you can just share a bit on, on your view on, on uh, how incentives uh, play a role in, in stopping deforestation. Yeah, so, thanks, Renzo. So, so the, the incentives um, that I've, I've seen firsthand are, are not currently in cocoa. Uh, so I'm seeing much more of that happening in, in sort of the, the areas where HCS and HCV have been applied uh, uh, from, for a number of years now, such in places like Indonesia. Uh, and then even in, in cases like that, it's, it's very much uh, community by community, not necessarily at a jurisdictional level for the time being. Um, and, I, and thinking back to the work that, that I've presented around ANCHI, I could also see the, the same challenge, you know, sort of same challenge there. We, we, we hadn't assessed entirely the, the jurisdiction. So but well, within the assessment area, I think what, what we would like to do as a, as a potential next step is to really sort of learn by doing again, uh, similar to what we did with the identification part of the assessment, but uh, to take those identification results and pick a number of farmers where we can sort of test and see what incentives would work and then think about how we could scale them to, to a wider uh, area across the entire assessment area or within the district that we assessed. So, much of it is to date uh, is very much at farmer level. Um, yep. Fantastic, Rob. And, and maybe just to give it a one uh, one last question here. Maybe let's let's take it to uh, the Ivory Coast because um, there's a few questions around the the new forest code uh, and uh, its application and and how that will. Uh, benefit uh, the country when it comes to no deforestation. So Jerome, how do you think the new forest code will affect forest reserves moving forward? And maybe you can quickly give uh, everyone just a, a brief background on what this forest code is and, and why it's it's so uh, relevant. I think Etel gave, uh, shared a bit, but if, if you can share uh, a bit um, from the Ivorian perspective, that, that would be really fantastic. I mean, uh, thank you very much, Renzo. You know, the, the Ivory Coast is one of the country where you have really um, within a couple of, of years, because you have you have the review of the forest code in 2014, July 2014, and the next review of the forest code was last, uh, last year, 
uh, July 2019. So you can see that uh, a, a kind of, you know, we are aware of the problem, we are aware of the challenges, and we want to change things on the ground. But for me, one thing is to, you know, to have the forest code. But another thing is the decree to implement the forest code on the ground. That is one, this, this next thing for me is, you know, you can, you can do all the load you want. If the people on the ground are not a, a, aware of what is in your law, and when we know the, the, the level of, you know, um, how do you call that, analphabetism in, in ivory coast, then it can only be challenging if the, the farmers, the local communities are not really uh, taking ownership, first of all, about the, the forest code and the decrees. But I can say on, on really the, the point of view of normative framework, the ivory, ivory coast is doing a lot of things. The next thing for me is going down to the local communities, to the farmers, to really so that they can take ownership of the, the low implementation. What I want to, to, to add to that is, you know, um, because some, some, some somebody asked about, I think it was Matthew who, who, who asked about having the deforestation, what can we do? I think the price is one issue. And, and I try to communicate about some of the price, uh, you know, on, on the charts. Uh, but at the same time, if you put the price, maybe the, the farmers may be uh, asking for more land to plant cocoa because they're having more, more <laughs> better price on the cocoa. So if we, we have to combine really with how can, do they see the importance of preserving forests? How do they see that if they don't have cocoa, they don't have forest tomorrow, uh, then, then, you know, it is, it is a kind of obligation actually to preserve forest. The other thing we, we, we have also to see if I have to preserve forest to the one hectare forest and that I can get more money than when I'm having, I'm, I'm clearing one hectare, uh, you know, forest for cocoa, then I may be also thinking about, okay, I have to preserve the patch of land I have here because for sure I will be getting for money. Uh, but it is not something, the calculation is done very quickly here at the farmer level. When we discuss with people, they say, look, I'm, I'm, okay, it's good for me. And what you are saying is good for the climate because I can see the climate change and things like that. But I need to feed my family. And what do you want me to do? I am aware of the climate change, okay, but tomorrow I have to feed the family. So what should I do? So it is a question also we have to, to read of, for me there is a need of, of rethinking of the mechanism, how can we set up a context specific, you know, solution for, for, for forest conservation. Because it could be different from, from a region in Ivory Coast and could be different from country to country, another country. Thanks, thanks, Jerome. Uh, and so, with that, uh, I think we've reached the the end of uh, this Coco webinar. So again, uh, it's been recorded. We'll share that. Uh, lots of other questions are out there. So we'll do our best to to get back to to as many of those as possible afterwards by email when we send out the the recording. So. Uh, thanks to to everyone that joined, and a very very special thanks to. Uh, to Ethan, to Etel, to Pierre, uh, to Jerome and Rob for taking the time uh, to participate here. Uh, we greatly appreciated it. Um, and so with all that, thanks everyone and have a good uh, rest of your days and hope to see you on the next uh, webinar. Thank you.